Good evening. Welcome to Garden Hour, brought to you by STSU Extension each week at this hour. I'm Rhoda Burroughs, and I'm going to be your host tonight. Um, before I introduce our panelists, just let me remind you that the question and answer uh, icon at the bottom of the screen is the one that you want to use to enter questions, and you can enter them anytime throughout the program, uh, either on what the speaker is talking about, or if it just comes to your mind, you can put it in and, and we'll deal with it when the, when the proper time comes. So tonight, uh, we have some guest panelists, uh, the, and I'll introduce uh, each one, and, and they can tell you a little bit about uh, who they are and what they're doing and what they're going to talk about tonight. Um, and then we'll get started with the with the main uh, slide presentation. So uh, first of all, we have Brett Owens, who is our uh, local foods instructor and turf grass extension. Brett, do you want to say hi to the? Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me on tonight. Um, as Dr. Burroughs indicated, I'm Brett Owens. I teach horticulture here at SDSU, which includes the local foods program and turf as well. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some pretty common spring turf grass issues that we have and maybe some do's and don'ts uh, as far as spring turf maintenance goes. Thank you. And we have also with us, not as a formal panelist tonight, but has sort of a pinch hitter, uh, Dr. Christine Lang. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm a new assistant pr professor and extension specialist in consumer horticulture here on campus in Brookings. I get the pleasure of working closely with our master gardeners across the state, 400 and growing strong. Um, in addition to getting to collaborate on herbaceous plant research projects and work with McCrory Gardens and lots of other wonderful partners across the state. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And yes, I'll be hanging out in the background, helping facilitate some questions and probably weighing in on a question or two. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Christine. And uh, looks like John was able to get back on. We'll give him a few minutes. Welcome, John. Uh, we just started hosting the meeting. Don't know if you've had a chance to uh, get your bearings yet. John had a little bit of a computer issue. So uh, John will be our, our first panelist up tonight. And I'll turn it over to you, John, if you're ready. I hope so. <laughs> if, uh, if everybody can uh, hear me and apologize for the delay, uh, computer troubles. How many times have we seen those? Um, if Christine's on here and she's already up, so I appreciate that. She's showing the first slide that I have. And last week I mentioned a, uh, a tr uh, tree that was flowering at the Extension Center in Rapid City. And I called it the Spring Snow Crab App. And I took this picture this morning in Brookings, South Dakota, and you can see the spring snow crab apple is just beginning to drop its petals. And you see why it gets the name spring snow. Uh, literally, you have to shovel your drive uh, as this tree is dropping its petals. And we have a whole street of these in the area in which I live. And yesterday when the petals were getting to drop, it literally looked like a snowstorm. Uh, there's that many. Now, again, if you're one of these folks that don't like to rake up material, this is not a tree for you. Uh, because when the petals fall, the petals fall. Now, this tree does not have any fruit uh, come fall. Uh, so it's one of those crab apples that you're seeing it in all its splendor for about a week and then about a day or two of shoveling uh, or get the snow blower out and use it one more time. Uh, but I thought everybody would be interested. I mean, it, literally, it does look like snow. Well, if, uh, if Christina can get me the, if Christine can get my next slide up here. I'll discuss the other item that I did want to talk about, and that is the leaves are just beginning to come out on the uh, 
on the crab apple, excuse me, on the uh, uh, elm ash trees. And with that, the season begins for treating for emerald ash borne. I did mention it last week, but I wanted to go with just a little bit more detail. Uh, this is showing some of the injection equipment that can be used. There's a number of different manufacturers out there. And if you inject now, at this time of year, as the leaves are coming out, so now it'll be taken up. Uh, the thing that'll happen now, though, is as the adults are emerging, and they should start emerging about the first week of June, typically they like to go back and attack the same tree they came out of. They're pretty much homebodies. But they've got to munch on leaves for about two weeks before they lay eggs. Well, if the tree's been injected, what's going to happen is as the adults feed on the leaves, uh, they're gonna die. So that's perfect. Uh, the other thing is if any, if you happen to have a beetle come in that didn't munch on the leaves, but happens to lay some eggs, the larvae will be very tiny and are easily killed. The other one I do wanna mention is that trunk injection is the preferred method. That way we're targeting the chemical into the tree itself there are other methods such as injecting in the soil, but there we might end up killing non-target organisms. So trunk injection is preferred. And as a reminder, which I mentioned last week, if you have a tree that you can't get your hands around, all right, and by hands, I mean literally your hands, not your arms, but your hands around. If you can't get your hands around it, it's too big to treat it with anything you can buy at the garden centers, at um, um, the department stores and such, you really do need to go out and hire a commercial company to come in and do it. Well, let's go from the bad news. Oh, and I should also mention again, Emerald ash borers only been confirmed in Minnehaha and Lincoln County. So those are the only two counties that really advise that you treat your trees. But if you have an ash tree alike and you live in either of those two counties, uh, this is the year to start if you have not started so already. But let's go to a better note. So, Christine, yes. Oh, my gosh. Look at those from an undisclosed location, which will <laughs> not be mentioned. Uh, what you're looking at here are morels. And we chatted last week that it was kind of the start of the season. And the season starts as the lilacs are just beginning to bloom. And now they're almost in full bloom. So we're kind of hitting the peak of the morel season. And Brookings, it's supposed to start raining tonight. And, and we're all keeping our fingers crossed that it will, as I'm sure many of you are across the state. If we get a little rain by, oh, say Friday, any that haven't popped are going to start popping then because a little moisture really gets them going. And for those of you that are morel hunters, you all know what I'm talking about. Getting out there now this weekend, old stumps, particularly around old elm trees that have died. But frankly, you go through any little woods, and I know woods are hard to find in South Dakota. You can probably find these. And everybody's got their secret spot, and they will not divulge it. I do have to mention one more thing, though is even though morels are considered one of the foolproof four, in other words, one of the mushrooms you can eat that it's hard to uh, mistake another mushroom for, still make sure the first time you go out morel hunting, go out with an experienced hunter. We do have a false morel. Now the false morel doesn't look close to this, but I'm not going to describe the differences here because I just want you to let you know that there are some that kind of look close and you don't want to Google this one. You want to go out with someone who's gone morel hunting before, probably not going to take you to their favorite patch, but go out and take a look or collect some and bring them back without eating them and have somebody verify that yes, indeed, there are morels. And I'm quite serious on that. Eating a, a mushroom that is not a morel can give you quite a tummy ache and can kill you. So this is something you don't want to guess wrong. But for right now, for this past week, and probably next week for all the morel hunters, uh, they're gonna be out there and uh, picking like crazy because it does look pretty good.
All right, well, that's both my slides. And now I'm gonna see what sort of questions we've got. Um, I've got one right here from Yankton. We're noticing insect galls appearing on some of the young bur oak trees. Are these deadly? You know, I hate to say it, but yes. Uh, we're starting to have some real problems with gulls appearing on uh, oak trees. Now, the interesting thing, and I'll, I'll show you pictures next week, so that's a great question, is that one of the problems that we have is not that the insect itself is causing the problem, but the woodpeckers will shred the bark off the tree looking for these little insects. And so we've got to, well, we've really got to watch it. And right now we're doing a trial to see if we can use some chemicals to kill the gall wasp. But the gall wasp in itself actually doesn't cause much of a problem. The real problem that occurs is the woodpeckers that actually go after them. I've got another question. Who does trunk injections in South Dakota for Emerald Ashbor? Remember, we're looking at Minnehaha and Lincoln County as the locations to do the treatments. And uh, what you want to do is go to the City of Sioux Falls website. And when you go to the City of Sioux Falls, uh, look up a link to Emerald Ashbor applicators. And they maintain a list of applicators for the city of Sioux Falls. These applicators have the appropriate license. They've had training and they also have maintain, are maintaining insurance. So I know some of the surrounding communities are just telling people, hey, go to the Sioux Falls list and find someone that you want. And, and by the way, there's, I forget, at, at least a couple of dozen applicators that are out there. So you shouldn't have any problem finding one. And then John, can we find morel mushrooms in the Black Hills? Yes. In fact, I'm going to be going out there this weekend, but I'm not telling you where. <laughs> However, I do find false morels out here, out there more than anywhere else in the state. And next Tuesday night, I'll be actually be broadcasting from the Black Hills and I'll try to bring in a morel and if I can, I'll find a false morel. They sometimes start coming up a little bit later. But once again, I hate showing them just because I don't want people to think from the show alone, they'll be able to separate them. But yes, indeed, I have collected morels out there as well. This other question here is just great. And that is, I have a mature Black Hill spruce. Uh, if the spring and summer stay dry, should I be watering it? Yes. As we all heard last week from Laura, our climatologist gave a very dismal view of the summer, hotter than normal and drier than normal. And spruce do not like dry climates. Spruce were not here several hundred years ago in, outside of the Black Hills. And there's a good reason for that. It's too hot and dry for spruce to do well. Now they'll take the heat, but they do need the moisture. Without knowing the size of the tree, it's kind of hard to tell, but I would say you should be watering about once a week. Ideally, they'd get an inch of water a week, but um, you're probably going to be putting down several hundred gallons. What I suggest is water until it's wet down to about six inches, and then don't water again until it, it dries. And so watering once a week deeply uh, is going to be kind of important, but don't use one of those deep feeders. Most of the spruce roots are really going to be in that upper six inches or so. Um, so water, take a screwdriver, stick it down in there. If it's still wet at the base, you can hold off, but uh, otherwise water. But yes, excellent question. This will be the year to water. I'll get a lot of spruce calls. Why is my spruce dying? What do I spray? And the answer is going to be H2O. <laughs> Well, I've used up my segment, and I apologize for the computer problems. Everybody here has ran into them. I did have one more question on the difference between real and false morels. I'll bring in, if I collect the false, I'll bring in the real and the false next week and show you the difference. That's better. But again, a reminder that 
the first time you go out morel hunting, make sure you go out with someone who's willing to show you the ropes. But with that, that's enough on woody plants. And tonight, I'm pleased to say we have Brett along, who's already introduced himself, and he's going to talk to you about lawn care. So with that, Brett, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, John. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some common turf grass issues that uh, we've been approached about this spring, uh, every spring, and by far the biggest is compaction. Uh, I've been um, around looking at some lawns. I've looked at a lot of pictures that folks have sent in, and we see issues like what we've got up on the screen here where it's, it's kind of patchy, we're not really sure what's going on. And a lot of times it has to do with compaction. So you got to remember uh, over the winter time, uh, even if we get a little bit of snow, all that kind of blankets down on top of your turf as well as the other moisture and things that you have and it forces that soil to, to kind of compact. Uh, which is not really conducive to grow good grass. The problem is when you uh, have a turf stand, uh, it's very important to keep uh, pretty equal amounts of air and water flow growing through that soil in order to let those roots expand and grow and, and propagate even further. When they don't have that ability to do that, it, it's, it's almost like, like choking them out. Um, so that brings up my, my number one goal for, for spring is if needed, if you haven't aerated in a long time or if you've never aerated, um, getting a good aeration onto your lawn will help that compaction immediately. A uh, question that I have gotten a few times here this spring is do we use solid core or hollow tine aerators? And the answer to that uh, for our area is definitely going to be the hollow tine. Uh, between a two inch and a three inch hollow tine, it spits out those little plugs that kind of look like, like goose poop on your lawn and it doesn't look too sightly and that's why a lot of people don't do it, but I cannot stress enough how important it is in order to keep that, that soil healthy so that your, your turf can grow. Um, aerators, that, that those deposits that come off of the aerator uh, will easily melt away within a, within a couple of weeks with your watering routine and everything else. So it, it, the, the unsightly part will be there for just a second. All right, Christine, uh, the next slide, please, that I want to talk about is another big issue is salt. Salt and snow and nutrition, all these issues that we're seeing. So what you are seeing up on the screen there is a couple of pictures that were sent to me uh, a couple of weeks ago from uh, up north of Brookings a little ways. And we can see that we've got a lot of curious issues going on with the turf that is pretty common in the spring. Um, definitely some compaction going on there. Uh, also, when we investigate it a little bit further, we try to realize or understand what type of a nutrition program that the uh, owner is using throughout the past couple of years. That kind of gives us a, a hint as to maybe what's going on. And so when you take some of that, those snow issues uh, with compaction, nutrition, and things like that, all of those combined can be pretty nasty for a lawn. So another thing that you can see up there, picture's not the greatest, but one of the other issues that we have with snow is if we have a winter like we did last year where we got, uh, it got cold rather quickly, we got some snow, the ground wasn't quite frozen yet, uh, you're basically just putting a blanket, like you're putting a tarp over your lawn. And everybody knows what happens when you've got moisture that's kind of caught in there. It's gonna, it's gonna cause some mold issues that can uh, definitely not be helpful for your lawn at all. So things like that um, are all part of a good, uh, not only your spring program, but all the way through the summer and into the fall, making sure that your turf stand is prepared to handle our winters. And again, that's going to vary. Some years we'll have nasty winters and some years we're going to have a little bit more mellow winters. So we have to take all that into consideration. All right, uh, Christine, we'll go to the next slide, please. Salt is another, salt and water damage is another issue that a lot of people are writing, writing in about and sending pictures about uh, over the spring. So salt can come from a number of different sources. Um, 
I won't go into to all of those, but people always want to know how do we get rid of that salt and is it going to be damaging to our lawn? And the answer to that is if, if you don't do something about it, it could definitely be damaging to your lawn and it, and it could, uh, it could also um, kill your lawn. So this is a picture uh, up near Aberdeen, South Dakota that, that uh, was submitted and there's obviously quite a bit of salt damage going on in that area. Uh, kind of a low, uh, low part of their lawn uh, where a lot of the, the salt accumulated and obviously uh, ended up causing a problem. So there's, there's a couple of cultural things that you can do to, to kind of help with that salt. When you first notice it in the spring, um, the very first thing that we're going to want to try to do is to, to try to leach as much of that out. And when I say leach, we're literally going to, we're going to use a, a hose on that lawn as soon as we can and, and try to, to, to overwater a little bit to leach some of that out. So one of the biggest mistakes that we hear about when we're trying to leach that is somebody will just take a hose out there uh, without any type of a head on it and they'll just kind of run it all over. And that's really not effective. If you are able to grab one of those little shower head type ends that you can put on your hose that you can get it at any one of the big box stores, the, the key is to kind of get as even of, of a spread of water over there as you can. And usually uh, we'll do that over a two to three day period uh, to kind of help leach that down. And then the next thing that we're going to want to do is use some time, some type of a pelletized uh, gypsum, which is also um, pretty available from from pretty much anywhere uh, in, in the big box stores down to your specialty stores in whatever town you're in. And it's the calcium and the sulfur that's in there that's going to kind of counteract that that salt. Um, how can we how can we prepare our lawn for that in the winter time? You know what? <laughs> There's really not a lot you can do except for make sure that your lawn is as healthy as it can be in the fall um, before it goes into that dormant uh, part of the part of the season. If you are somebody that lives in a town where they still use uh, salt uh, on ice, and then you've got one of the big trucks that come by and kind of blades it all off, it's probably going to end up on your boulevard if you've got a, the, a, the front part of your lawn when that happens. And until, until they change that, it's, it's just going to be something that we're going to have to deal with. Okay, a um, couple other things that I wanted to mention about uh, the turf for your for your spring. Another question that I get a lot is, um, if you're somebody that that isn't really set up on a good fertilization program yet, uh, the question is, what what is the uh, best type of fertilizer? What type of fertilizer should we use? And my answer to that is, uh, with turf grass, if if you really aren't 100% sure you don't have a soil test yet, whatever the case may be, probably the best you can do um, is a 20-10-15. Uh, so with turf grass, we want to have our, our uh, nitrogen typically to be two to four times higher than your phosphorus level, depending on exactly what you've got. And then your, your potassium uh, rate for your fertilizer is generally about half of what the nitro nitrogen um, ratio is. So we, we keep that at about a 20, 10, 15. But I, I can't stress enough, it is so easy to do a soil test nowadays. Uh, to, to find out exactly what your lawn's trying to tell you. That's the hardest part. Um, fortunately, our lawn can't get up and, and speak to us, so we have to interpret what its needs are. And that soil test is a great, easy way to do it. Um, there's a lot of wonderful places that will do a soil test for you. Um, if you have any you know, questions or you would like a recommendation about where to send it, I'd be happy to answer that. And if you throw that question up or uh, put it into the, into the, uh, the um, answer part or the uh, submit question part. So, all right, uh, we'll move on to the questions here. And it looks like, oh, Perry Johnson. Hi, Perry, how are you? Uh, your question is, what do you recommend about using wood chips as a mulch in gardens and for landscaping? Uh, it is in great supply right now. Well, you're right. It's definitely in great supply right now. And uh, there's two thoughts. There's two thoughts to that. Um, number one, it's it, if you're going to use it as a movable mulch, 
yeah maybe but remember that it's it's if if you're just going to leave it there it's not going to break down as quickly as you might think uh, and then the other big thing about wood mulch is you have to be really careful where it's being sourced from uh, there could be a lot of issues going on with the that that material might have been mulched uh, we can't really guarantee that uh, all the proper precautions were, were, were done in order to, to make sure that's clean. So you just have to be really careful with that. All right, I'm gonna move on to, ah, Donna has a question here. Is it better to aerate in the spring than fall? Very good question, Donna. If you only have an opportunity to do one or the other, fall is probably the best time to do it. If you uh, haven't haven't uh, done it ever before and it needs it this spring, sure can, but one or the other fall is the best. I usually recommend both. All right, um, Beth has a question here. Digging out dandelions from the lawn, is that considered equal to aerating my lawn? Well, sometimes it feels like it for sure. If you have a bunch of dandelions and you're pulling them all out, yeah, that's gonna leave a lot of spots in there. Unfortunately, uh, that's probably not going to do do the same thing as a good aerator. Um, hand weeding dandelions effective. It's probably going to be about the most effective way that you can. The big thing about dandelions is you got to get that whole root out of there or you're going to have trouble. So um, I prefer to dig them out by hand. There's some pretty easy tools that you can get from any of the box stores that, that makes that task a little bit easier. And the second part of her question is, is there a company that provides plugs of buffalo grass? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe Dr. Burroughs can maybe answer for the west side of the state for sure. But I think uh, if you're in the east part of the state, uh, most of the seed dealerships around uh, our area anyways can usually get them or give you a pretty good recommendation as to where you get them. Okay, so I think that is, I think I got time for one more question here. Uh, I enlarged my vegetable garden with redded sod cutter, transplanted the sod, prepped the area by tilling, leveled the best I could, transplanted the sod and watering. Should I fertilize the transplanted sod? Yes, absolutely. So we've got a situation where we've um, basically moved some of our carpet of grass and into a new area that we want to, want to um, get it established here. So the big thing is uh, before you start fertilizing is make sure that that sod is actually establishing a good root zone underneath. Um, generally, you're talking about anywhere from three to six weeks, depending on, on uh, uh, exactly what the climate and what, what type of grass you have, but make sure that that's, that that's all uh, creating a good, a good root zone underneath there first. So I think that's all the, the time that I have for my section right now, but I'll certainly I'll certainly try to answer the rest of the questions uh, through the through the uh, answer box a little later on. So next, I think we're moving on to. I'm not sure if uh, Christina is live yet. If not, I guess I. Yep, can't. I'm here. Oh, perfect. So we're gonna we're gonna turn things over to Christina over at McCrory Gardens. All right, hi everybody. Um, I'm Christina from here at Macquarie Gardens and I'm here in the gardens just to kind of give you an update of what's going on in the gardens. Um, we do hope to see you visit. We're open right now from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. from Wednesday to Sunday. So we do hope to, hope to see you come and see all the things that are happening and blooming right now. There's a lot of fun things blooming and there's some other activities coming up too that I'll mention first and then I'll hope to get you um, a chance to show you a few of these plants. Um, but this Thursday, there's third Thursday, which I'm actually going to be teaching this Thursday on um, designing gardens. And so I hope you can join me for that. And that is 6.30 p.m. And you can register. Um, you should be able to find the link on our website, the um, SD State McCrory Gardens website, or on Facebook. Um, there's events created for that as well. And, um, and then June, we're doing our, um, our class on pollinators with Dr. Amanda Bachman. And some of that, so that'll be fun to talk about that next month as well. Um, and then next week, we also have Phil Baker coming. I don't know if anybody's familiar with him, but he does a lot of children's concerts and stuff next Wednesday. So if you want to come hang out with some music in the gardens, that's a great time to do it. But just for some other things going on in the gardens, generally things blooming. Um, I, I sat right here on purpose so that you could see this beautiful 
um, magnolia behind me. So this is actually um, the Anne Magnolia. And you can see it is just beautiful. And it kind of looks almost like a, a tulip type magnolia that is blooming right now. And um, it kind of looks like something that wouldn't even grow in our climate, but it grows really good for us here at McCroy Gardens. And um, I hope you all um, can come see these lovely shrubs. The tulips are still blooming. So if you wanna see tulips, but not in the big giant bed. So some of those, be th some of those flowers um, have kind of pushed through their cycle as well as um, have been, were nipped a little bit by the frost. Um, the, they don't seem to damage the leaves, but it did get some of those blossoms but all these little pocket tulips that are kind of throughout the gardens, if I can show you a little bit here, are still blooming very beautifully in the gardens, as well as a lot of daffodils are blooming. So if you like daffodils, there's definitely um, a lot of daffodils th blooming throughout the gardens to come see. If you're a fan of crab apples, they're sure lovely right now in the gardens. Um, it, not that you can't find any in Brookings, but they are, they do absolutely brighten up the gardens as you can kind of see behind me. We have this lovely crab apple. Um, and then we also have some anemone windflowers and past flowers blooming. Um, so I'm gonna show you these anemones because they're really beautiful as well. These are blooming in the gardens, which is a really lovely plant, but we do recommend that you deadhead them after, after they flower. Um, and don't let them set the seed because they will spread their seed um, and maybe pop up where you didn't want them. They don't seem to take over too badly for us, but we do recommend deadheading them. So, and if you guys ever do have questions about McCrory, um, feel free to send messages to me or the other staff or call our visitor center. Um, our number is um, 688-6707. So we love answering everybody's questions about the gardens and hope that you're able to come see. There's another one that I really wanna to get to to show you before my time is done for the update of what's going on here, but it is our Homestead Buckeye. So I'm not sure how many of you might be familiar with the Homestead Buckeye, but it was developed by South Dakota State University and McCrory Gardens by Norm Evers and he, um, and, it is very lovely right now because it's blooming, which not everybody thinks of a buckeye tree when they think about planting a tree that'll flower for them. But you'll see, you, you might be able to see it right there behind me already, but I'll get a little bit closer so that you all can see it a little bit better. The two, I do see a question in there that, um, the, the, someone planning to visit McCrory, yay! <laughs> and will the tulips still be blooming? Um, there will probably be some tulips still blooming, not a lot. A lot of them will be done, but I can tell you that other things will be blooming because there is always something blooming. But here is our homestead buckeye. You can kind of get a good view of that. So it has this lovely kind of um, shape to it as well as all these very beautiful flowers. So I don't know if you can see those, but um, a very, very nice tree to, to check out here in McCrory Gardens. It has this really nice bowling ball shape um, to it. And it also has a really beautiful um, kind of orange fall color um, that does really nicely for us in this area. The waterfall is up and running. It's kind of newly up and running. The planting has begun, the big plant, the big dig, that's what they're calling it. Um, so they just actually started planting this week. We generally wait until about May 15th. We check that 10 day. And if we're seeing a lot of warm days and not a lot of risk of frost um, before May 25th, then we might start planting some of our annuals. So they generally go in here late in May and early June. And so you can see our waterfall is going there. Ah, I, don't, I don't need to be in that shot, <laughs> but let's see if I can do good with my camera work here. <laughs> and we have the beautiful Perkins flag in the backdrop sometimes here, but it's definitely a fun thing to see here. The trial gardens are what is planted now. So I'll give you a quick peek at those and then hopefully you'll get to come see them yourselves. 
it looks like I have just about a minute and then I'm done, but I wanted to show you a peek of this first. So here are our trial gardens. So you can see there are a lot of really neat plants. I'm gonna go actually where the containers are. And we are trialing these, meaning we are seeing how they perform in the South Dakota climate for us. And um, we have all these different varieties and we'll report back to the companies and let them know how these flowers perform in our climate and report back to them. And that helps them with marketing and things um, to know what they can grow here. So yeah, definitely do come see what's going on here and what we're growing. And we look forward to seeing you all. Thank you, Christine. You're muted. <laughs> oh, I'm muted. When did I mute that? <laughs> Just the last few sentences. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, I'm sorry. My finger must have hit that there when I was showing you this trial garden. So I do hope that you all get to come see the things that are planting and being planted here in the garden. And um, yeah, I will pass that back to you. And thank you for Christine for putting in the links, the chat there for the registration to third Thursday as well. So, Christina, before you go, I have one question. You have the pots there. Are they the same plants that are behind them or are they something else? Yes, no, great question. So yes, they are the same plants. They have us trial the plants in the, in the ground and in the containers um, and kind of compare those. There are a few that they have us just trial in the containers, but for the most part, we trial them. And, and then there's a few that just are in the ground, but primarily they're in the ground and in the containers. so. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining me at McCrory for a few minutes. Thank you, Christina. And Christine, if you can pull up my slides. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about transplants because a lot of people are transplanting right now and I'm starting to get some uh, pictures that look like like these in the in the on the screen. Um, so you probably often hear the advice that you should harden off your transplants. And maybe you know what that means, maybe you don't. Uh, I've read, read descriptions of everything from a few days to up to two weeks. And I have to admit, I don't know that I have the patience to go through a two week hardening off process, but I might if my income depended upon it. But um, usually just, you know, up to a week gives the plant uh, time to develop a thicker cuticle on the leaves. So, so what we're doing, we, we bring in a transplant that's come from a greenhouse where it's protected, there's not much breeze, uh, the sun's not real bright. And we take that plant and we shove it outdoors where it's windy, the sun is very bright and it might even be hot. and, and that plant has not developed a coating on its leaf to protect it from those kinds of conditions. So by taking the plant and we take it and maybe put it out for a couple hours uh, the first day, maybe in partial sun, maybe in full sun, depending on the conditions, but give it a little bit of exposure so it starts uh, getting the message that it has to toughen up a little bit. And through those conditions, it will start to create a, a stronger cuticle, that, that surface that goes over the entire leaf, uh, it, will, it will thicken up that cuticle, which does two things. It, it protects it from moisture loss and it will uh, help screen out some of the UV light. And if you don't do that, then then you often end up with with uh, plants that look like this, and and people often send these and and wonder, you know, what kind of disease their plant has, and maybe uh, what what they should spray on it. And 
one of the giveaways, um, well, there are two giveaways to this transplant shock. One is it was a, <laughs> a plant that was just taken out and planted. Um, and so that's, that's one of the first things to make you think, well, maybe it wasn't quite adapted to the outdoors yet. The other, often you'll see browning along the outside edges of the leaves um, or in an area that sort of pokes up above the rest and is a little bit more exposed. And so uh, those are, are two of the things that we often see with some transplant stress. So uh, next slide, please. And I wanted to talk tonight some about rhubarb. Because rhubarb is coming on looking real good right now. Um, rhubarb is a perennial. And you plant it with these little roots that, that don't look very promising. <laughs> when, you, when you first look at the rootstock, you'll plant that with the, with the uh, base of the stalk at ground level. Um, rhubarb is a, what we call a heavy feeder, so yeah, it's a good idea to often the tradition was to put uh, a layer of, of manure on the plants each fall. That gives it time to, to work into the soil over the winter and feeds it for the coming spring. Um, so we start out with this little, uh, little cutting there that we have or division, and it should have at least a couple um, buds on it. And then the second year, as it starts to grow, we've got a second year plant there in the lower right hand side, and then a fully established plant there on the left. Um, unlike asparagus, you may remember from last week that we had to let it grow two full seasons before any kind of harvest. With rhubarb, you can plant it this year. If the plant has done well during the year, uh, you may be able to take off a few stalks next year. Don't get carried away. Um, but you can, can harvest a few stalks and then uh, the following year you should be able to take a, take a full harvest. So next slide please. So one of the questions that, that always comes up should I pull my stalks or should I cut them? And, uh, and there's there's sometimes a big fight over which is the appropriate way to do it. Uh, tradition is strong. Uh, pulling is very good. It separates the stalk uh, towards the base. And so it's, it's more where the, the plant is accommodated to do that. But cutting it at ground level is just fine too. It, it will seal over. So you can do whatever you prefer. Uh, if you're like me and, and tend to have a lot of accidents with knives, pulling might be the way to do it. On the right hand side, uh, we have a picture of a, a rhubarb that has gone to seed having flowering stalks. And we get a lot of questions about this every year that people are saying, you know, my rhubarb is sending up flowers. Why is it doing that? What should I do about it? Well, what you should do about it is go ahead and cut them down um, even before they get this well developed. So the plant isn't putting as much energy into developing this, the flowering stalk and, and developing seed. If you leave it, a lot of the energy of the plant will go into that seed development. So you won't have as much for stalks for next year. Uh, when you're harvesting, uh, if you over harvest, it can stress the plant some and that may cause it to send up a lot of flowers the following year because the plant is stressed. Uh, if it's not getting enough fertilizer, sometimes the plant will send up flower stalks because it's stressed. It, it, it's basically a stress reaction. The other uh, instance in, when, in which we see a lot of flower stalk formation is maybe this, this patch has been in the ground for four or five years and the inside of it is starting to die back a little bit. And that's a good time uh, to go in and split up the, 
the crowns and spread them out a little bit more. You should do that about every four or five years. Um, either early spring when you're just starting to see some growth. You can do it in the fall, but if you do that, make sure that, that you mulch it well so you don't get uh, frost heaving during the winter. And I think that's a, it for right now. Um, rhubarb is pretty uh, problem free. Um, it will get spots on it. There's a fungal spot that gets on it. Uh, there's not a whole lot that you can do uh, for that. There really aren't fungicides that are, are labeled for rhubarb. So uh, keeping it keeping it healthy, uh, making sure it has good airflow, uh, those kinds of cultural things are, are the way we approach that. How deep should rhubarb be planted? You saw there that the, the buds at the top should be just a little bit, just a little bit below or at ground level. When you dig it, you might take note if you're if you're splitting up a, a crown, you should take a look at where it is because it kind of seeks its own uh, ideal depth too. And then Rhoda, this is John. Um, you know, there's two things I can find at abandoned farmsteads in uh, South Dakota. One is the lilac shrub, the other is rhubarb. So why do you have to divide it and take care of it like this when it seems to do fairly well in an abandoned state? And it, it, it seems like you're right. Rhubarb does very well. It's on its own. I think probably the answer to that is because we're not harvesting it as heavily. And so uh, we're not stressing the plant. It has more ability to, to grow undisturbed. And so, uh, so it's, it's able to spread on its own and, and nobody's uh, trying to to keep it within bounds or anything like that, so. And then another question, um, if you're planting gourds in winter squash, <laughs> um, will the gourds ruin the squash if they cross pollinate? You know, that's the question I get almost every year with when people are planting their gardens and, and being careful about really any of the cucurbits cucumbers and gourds or cucumbers and melons. Um, and, and there's a myth out there that if you plant them too close together when they pollinate each other, that that will bring over the flavor of the gourd or the inedibility of the gourd to, to the plants that we actually want to eat. And uh, the answer to that is that pollen affects only the seed on the inside of the plant. It does not affect the uh, the fruit that we eat, the pumpkin, the squash, the cucumber is all actually the original uh, mother plant's tissue. It's it's an ovary. So we're eating ovaries uh, and it's not affected by the pollen. Now, if you're going to save the seed for next year, you might end up with some very interesting uh, cross pollinations. And in fact, uh, cucurbits have a, have a poison in some of their wild relatives. And some of that can come out uh, during these cross pollinations. Um, it's, you probably don't have to worry about it too much because if you take a bite of it, it will be very bitter and you will spit it out. But uh, if you do have a real bitter cucumber or a real bitter squash, um, don't feel shy about <laughs> spitting it back out because it is actually toxic. Right, Rhoda, I know you've got some rhubarb questions and I'll let you get into those, but I do have another follow-up to this one. Uh, I'm assuming the same thing applies to apples and crab apples. If I have my apple pollinated by a crab apple, that's not gonna affect the fruit, correct? That's correct. We often get that question too. 
Well, I see you got some rhubarb questions and in your last minute, you might wanna take care of some of those. All right. Uh, how long can rhubarb be harvested? This actually extends a little bit beyond the asparagus harvest usually, uh, maybe because we're not, we're not uh, being quite as drastic about it. Um, you can harvest up to about a third of the leaves of the plant. Um, and you can go into July or so. And after that, then you want to allow the plant to grow the leaves and replenish its resources for next year. Um, if you harvest too much for, for use, can you freeze it? Yes. How long will it last frozen? It might depend on how, how well you were able to seal that off. Um, but I know some people have, have uh, with a good seal can use it after a couple years. I don't know if I'd recommend that personally, but uh, it can also be canned. Of course, you, you get a real uh, soft texture then, but uh, I guess I already answered the other one. Uh, you can just take a stalk or two at a time if, if you want, if you're just using fresh. Uh, if you want to make a pie, maybe it's, you know, three or four stalks, but uh, but yeah, um, the other question I get sometimes in the fall, or it could be a late spring frost as well, if the leaves, uh, the leaves are toxic, <laughs> I should, should remind people that the leaves themselves are, are toxic, uh, the stem is what we, what we eat. If the leaves frost, will that toxin get into the stem? And so people are wondering, can I go out and harvest right after a frost? I would, you know, cut off probably the top couple inches that are right next to the leaf, but the rest should be fine. If it's frosted, of course, it will start to spoil pretty quickly. So you'd want to do that right away. All right, uh, I see we don't have any other questions there, but uh, uh, Christine, anything else you wanna add that's going on gardening wise? Well, I actually wanna build on the discussion that Brett started with mulch from Perry's question. Cause I wanna remind everyone as John has done as well that, you know, Laura Edwards, our state climatologist, we're going, we, we're in a drought and things don't look super optimistic for this summer. So if you're looking at your annual and your perennial, you know, your, your flowering plant beds, this would be the year to start using some form of a shredded bark mulch if you're not already doing so. And getting that two to three inches deep to preserve moisture, it keeps down the weeds. And by having that natural mulch, um, of course, it's not going to break down very quickly. But in this case, we don't want it to on those perennial beds. We want that mulch to last. And if it starts to get, you know, over the years get soil and dirt and things in there and it starts to be a weed problem, you can always top dress that mulch, which is the reason why I prefer to use, you know, a natural shredded bark mulch, not something that's dyed. So you're not worrying about matching the color in years to come. So if you're thinking about your, your perennial flower beds, I would really recommend using a natural shredded bark mulch. Again, as Brett cautioned, knowing the source of those wood chips is important to make sure that there's not residual herbicide or anything like that. Um, but John, I, I'm very curious, should I be using, what are your thoughts on rock mulch around shrubs? Because I wouldn't recommend it for perennials as a general rule. It ends up being a heat source. What are your thoughts for shrubs? All right, well, I gotta, I gotta prove guilty here. Uh, my wife and I've had that discussion. She's one, we have a rock mulch around our house. <laughs> um, but so let me start out with mulching. The ideal mulch is if you can chase the chipper down the street, and grab everything that came out of the chipper. That is at University of, of uh, Washington. They've looked at it. And that is not only shredded uh, bark and shredded wood, but it's shredded leaves. And it's really the best mulch. So, and you don't have to worry about sourcing it because it came out of the chipper. So if you can find a tree company and get the fresh uh, chips that they've just run through, that's really the best. Now, 
somebody's going to say, oh, my goodness, if I put fresh chips down, that's going to rob nitrogen from the soil. No, it's not because you're putting it on top of the soil. If you till it into the soil, that's a problem. But otherwise, leaving a, a, a layer on the surface, that will not cause a problem. John Lloyd, uh, University of Minnesota has researched that and found, yep, you leave it on the top, you're not going to get that nitrogen depression. So the best is that. However, 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 I will say Iowa State actually did a study and found there was a great place to put rock mulch rather than a shredded bark mulch. And it really gets back to what you said, Christine, and that is helps conserve moisture. There's some soils that are so poorly drained, we really don't want to conserve moisture. And actually they're a, a washed river rock, so it doesn't heat up as much with a fabric underneath it. So it's still breeze rather than plastic. Actually, the woody plants did better because the wood mulch or the shredded bark mulch was actually keeping the soils too mulched. Mm -hmm. So there is a spot for a, a rock mulch. One, if it helps your marriage, go with it. Two, <laughs> if uh, you do have poorly drained soils, which we do have in South Dakota, a, a rock mulch is not that bad. So I do want to point out there are some pluses to rock. We always think rock is bad. Uh, and I would agree rock is not going to break down, at least not unless we're looking at a very long time period where <laughs> that shredded wood mulch will break down and is incorporated in the soil. But uh, rock isn't bad. I'll, I'll end with that. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to stress one more time. And you said, you know, you want to use landscape fabric underneath, not just a straight plastic, because we need the ability for water to flow through that. And, and, and I would go, but as some of your master gardeners that are watching would say, I've even advocated not putting down any fabric mm -hmm. and piling about uh, 10 inches of mulch. And I know that sounds, oh my gosh, 10 inches. But you still have a very good oxygen infusion rate. And Linda out at Washington again has been really advocating that. And, you know, a fabric doesn't stop weeds from starting on top of the fabric. Mm -hmm. And so fabric is not the cure all, it's a plus. But I'm absolutely right. Plastic does not breathe. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. I'm going to I'm going to throw this one to the group and this might close out our questions tonight. So someone's asking what might be tipping over pots and digging up transplants at night. I have a guess, but I'm curious what others might think. <laughs> it would depend on what was transplanted in there. If it was catnip, I would say it's a cat because that's what's been happening in my own yard. But <laughs> um you know, potential for raccoons? What does anyone else think? <laughs> well, and, and I'll chime in first and let the others in, but I was going to go with cats as well. Uh, <laughs> cats do tend to like to do that. And if you have any catnip, forget it. That's happened. Rhoda, thoughts? Boy, I was, I was kind of going that way too. Um, you know, we have a lot of deer in our yard and, and they're not always as graceful as they're <laughs> made out to be yeah I, I you know i think this might be a good one to get a camera out there at night and take a look uh, but i i think the group's going with cats rather than raccoons skunks which are another possibility just wandering through deer and you're right they're not very cautious of where they step uh a teenager who has nothing better to do uh, might be another possibility, but uh, I think we're really coming up to time here now. So uh, we do want to point out to all our viewers here, and we certainly appreciate your continued attendance. And we'll be on next Tuesday at the usual time. I think we answered everyone's questions, but mm -hmm. if you have any additional questions, please contact these three centers that are up here right now. We do have people there on staff to help answer your questions. And if they can't, 
they are very good at referring the questions back to us. And in fact, uh, Sioux Falls contacted me this last week with a number of three questions. So a couple of days ago, that's what I was doing, driving around, uh, answering three questions in Sioux Falls. And I know the rest of our panelists are also more than happy to try to respond to email questions and that if the regional centers are not able to do so. So with that, thank you everyone for, um, uh, for watching this evening. Uh, we wish you happy gardening, as Tom Bear would say at the end of Garden Line. And we'll see you all next week at 7 p.m., 6 p.m. Mountain uh, for another episode of the Garden Hour. Thanks again.